Act Out is 100% activist, non-corporatized, independent news, and we need your help to keep acting out. To become a patron of the show, visit patreon.com slash act out. This week on ACT OUT, elected officials could be the next group of people rounded up and thrown in a cell. And while that might sound appealing, depending on the official, the reasoning behind it is nothing short of an authoritarian nightmare. Meanwhile, U.S. residents who have lived here longer than I've been alive find themselves targeted for deportation. And can we really have sanctuary cities in the midst of a tangled web of ICE and local law enforcement collusion? Next up, if you want to organize in the face of rising fascism, some rules for radicals could aid you in your work. And finally, Wendell Potter, a former health industry bigwig, unveils his project to expose and deconstruct the corporatocracy. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. If you've ever seen the Orwellian film V for Vendetta, you'll recall the fear-inducing black bags that would violently cover the heads of citizens as they were ripped from their homes, transported to chemical testing concentration camps, and eventually thrown into mass graves, sprinkled with a thin layer of lime. Spoiler alert. And while this whole scenario seems about as fantastic as, say, The Handmaid's Tale, at least the first part is not only real for many immigrant families, it might also be an impending scenario for America's mayors. On January 16th, Secretary of Homeland Security Kirstjen Nielsen told the Senate Judiciary Committee that, at her department's request, federal prosecutors are reviewing what avenues might be available to arrest and prosecute mayors of sanctuary cities for harboring unauthorized immigrants. Now, outside of being ludicrously authoritarian, this move isn't even supported by existing laws. Originally, the term sanctuary city was in fact coined by right-wing fucksticks, clearly unaware of the almost laughable irony in disdainfully referring to those who would, in supposed Christian fashion, harbor strangers in need. And while there's no specific definition for the phrase now, it more broadly refers to cities or towns that have made it clear that they won't assist federal agents in immigration work, which is actually a totally legal move, valid, and indeed logical. Literally, by definition, federal authorities are there to enforce federal law. Local? Local law. As immigration is a federal law, local law enforcement is under no obligation to assist with immigration law enforcement. But of course, if ICE agents have access to local databases and resources, their job is easier, it's quicker, and their quota of torn apart families and detained or deported longtime residents rises. A few years ago, the National Immigration Law Center outlined how ICE depends on local and state law enforcement in doing their work. This list includes factors such as ICE access to jails, both physically and technologically, checking fingerprints of RSDs, regardless of guilt or innocence, against the DHS database, allowing ICE agents into local jails to review records and confront prisoners, including immigration information in the National Crime Information Center, or NCIC, making it so that Local law enforcement can check the immigration status of people they stop or detain. And while they don't officially have the authority to enforce immigration law, local law enforcement agents often bring ICE agents along with them, or they're an easy phone call away. And seeing how these practices are already well entrenched across the U.S., it's actually more difficult for local officials to decouple ICE than to do the opposite. Again, that being said, they do have every right to do so. And while some may balk at the idea of mayors being dragged from their homes for keeping local law enforcement out of the em immigration debacle, the already substantial rise in long-term U.S. residents being dragged from their homes suggests that such an absurd threat may not be an idle one. Indeed, in December of last year, Human Rights Watch found that the number of people detained inside the U.S. rather than at the border, meaning that they were not new arrivals, increased by 42 percent over last year, while immigration arrests of people with no criminal convictions nearly tripled. 
While Trump flails and spews verbal diarrhea about a border wall, the focus of his administration has clearly been less on the border and more on longtime U.S. residents, people who have businesses and homes, people who have kids here, kids as young as 10 months, that they're being abducted from for the sake of, um, oh yeah, fascism. And the breadth of humanity now in the crosshairs of fascist detainment and deportation include the darlings of the military-industrial complex. For example, last week, 39-year-old Army veteran Miguel Perez Jr., who served two tours in Afghanistan and has lived in the U.S. since he was eight years old, lost an appeal to remain here. After returning home from Afghanistan, Perez was diagnosed with PTSD and a possible brain injury. As with many of his fellow veterans, he turned to drinking and drugs, and in 2008 he was charged with a felony drug conviction after being caught delivering cocaine. Last week, he began a hunger strike to protest deportation. Last Wednesday, he told the Chicago Tribune, If it comes down to me being deported, I would rather leave this world in the country I gave my heart for. As disgusting as this case is, it's not unusual. Neither for Perez nor some of the 70,000 other non-citizens who have enlisted in the U.S. military over the past decade. Perez thought that due to his oath to protect the nation and two tours in Afghanistan, he had become a citizen. But as he found out when he left prison in 2016 after serving time for his drug charge, that's not the case. He was immediately transported to a detention center where he's been since his release from jail. In court, Perez argued that he had no connection to living in Mexico and that going back would be dangerous for him. He has two children who were born here, an entire life built on being American. Perez's options are slim, but his resolve is strong. As of the taping of this show, no news has come out regarding his hunger strike. Outside of seeking a pardon of Perez's conviction, his attorney, Chris Bergen, said that our other strategies are to push for his release due to a recent psychiatric exam that show Miguel's PTSD is severe and he's in danger of self-harm if continued in detention. He needs to be released on either an ankle bracelet or an order of supervision so he can access his VA benefits to get treatment. And keep in mind, he's already done prison time for his drug conviction. This is an added punishment for having lived in this country as an almost too stereotypically good citizen while being brown and losing the geographical birth lottery. Perez, along with countless others, are facing deportation, detention, and death for the sake of fear-based white supremacist and authoritarian aims. The dangers to our communities come in uniform with ice across the chest. As friends, neighbors, loved ones, as human beings, we have an obligation to stand up in the face of these attacks. Chances are that in your community, there's an organization that deals with immigrant rights. Connect with them. And I do stress the point of a local organization because they will know better, better than a big detached NGO, what people need on the ground because they are the people on the ground. Attend meetings or trainings, learn about things like accompanying people to immigration check-ins, as those who are accompanied are less likely to be detained. Find out ways in which you can make your town, your city, your community an actual sanctuary for people, not fascism. Moving on, as we consider ways to be vigilant in the fight for human rights, it seems as good a time as any to get cozy with a pragmatic primer for realistic radicals. Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky is a 1971 publication that outlines lessons on how community organizers can unite people in order to effectively build and fight. Alinsky himself was a community organizer in the Chicago area for about 40 years, organizing on issues such as poverty and civil rights. Alinsky is immediately critical of those who cop out from the fight, the ones who embrace a nihilist perspective or those who'd rather just tune out and escape, or those who use their experiences as an excuse to run away. An example he uses is that if he wanted to organize Orthodox Jews, he wouldn't wander into their neighborhood eating a ham sandwich just so he could say it didn't work. He highlights thereby the importance of communication, and that indeed, without proper communication, we are effectively silent in the face of a system whose oppression is far too loud. The underlying theme is one of participation, and however we choose to work, this point is a very important one. And while he does, however, suggest that the only path forward is to work within the system, and one can argue how he'd feel about the world today and whether his opinion would have shifted, those of us working outside the system can also pick something up from his writings. 
Indeed, as he writes in the prologue, it is for those young radicals who are committed to the fight, committed to life. Remember, we are talking about revolution, not revelation. You can miss the target by shooting too high as well as too low. First, there are no rules for revolution any more than there are rules for love or rules for happiness, but there are rules for radicals who want to change their world. There are certain central concepts of action in human politics that operate regardless of the scene or the time. And while I don't agree with all the points in a strict sense, the wheels that turn having been inspired by this read make it well worth a focused and, as always, critical read. And for the sake of whetting your appetite and indeed planting a few seeds, here are, in shorter form, Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, with a few added notes by me. Rule 1. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Rule 2. Never go outside the expertise of your people. It results in confusion, fear, and retreat. It also means a collapse of communication. If you're lacking an expert on a particular subject or issue, crowdsource it, thereby bringing in new people, new ideas, and new tactics. Rule 3. Whenever possible, go outside the expertise of the enemy. Here you want to cause confusion, fear, and retreat, and this also circles back to Rule 1. If you can expose your target and make them feel insecure, your potential power, in their mind, increases. Rule 4. Make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. You can kill them with this, for they can no more obey their own rules than the Christian church can live up to Christianity. Rule 5. Ridicule is man's most potent weapon. It's almost impossible to counteract ridicule. Also, it infuriates the opposition, who then react to your advantage. Think of political satire, or, or of the anti-fascist clowns, such as the one who rabidly pissed off a group of fascists who shouted white power, to which the clowns responded wife power and white flower, all while prancing around in wedding dresses and tossing flower into the air. Rule 6. A good tactic is one that your people enjoy. They'll keep doing it without urging and come back to do more. They're doing their thing and will even suggest better ones. So often activism is couched in the morbid and unfun paradigm of continuously fighting, but in reality so much of activism is so fun. Serious need not mean solemn. We're not only fighting for lives, but we're living them, and that should include a fair share of smiling. Rule 7. A tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. People can sustain militant interest in any issue for only a limited time, after which it becomes a ritualistic commitment, like going to church on Sunday mornings. New issues and crises are always developing, and one's reaction becomes, well, my heart bleeds for those people, and I'm all for the boycott, but after, after all, there are other important things in life, and there it goes. An old tactic also remo removes you from the radar in this new digital age. Your work will get more press and thereby support if you keep it interesting, but more importantly, if your tactic drags on, you'll more than likely not be shifting with new information and facts that would necessarily affect that tactic's efficacy. Stay with the here and now, your place in time, and move accordingly. Rule 8. Keep the pressure on, never let up. Keep trying new things to keep the opposition off balance. Utilize all events of the period for your purpose. Rule 9. The threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Imagination and ego can dream up many more consequences than any activist. While this is often true, this rule can result in you walking into situations unprepared. Prepare for the worst, but don't let the threat keep you shuttered inside, afraid to face the fight. Privilege also plays a role here. Acknowledge your own and don't be afraid to use it against the opposition. Rule 10. The major premise for tactics is the development of operations that will maintain a constant pressure upon the opposition. It is this unceasing pressure that results in the reactions from the opposition that are essential for the success of the campaign. It should be remembered not only that the action is in the reaction, but that the action is itself the consequence of reaction and of reaction to the reaction. Da, 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 da. The pressure produces the reaction, and constant pressure sustains action. Go back and watch that again if that sounds confusing. Rule 11. If you push a negative hard enough, it will push through and become a positive. Violence from the other side can win the public to your side because the public sympathizes with the underdog. And the violence argument is one that I have had often on the show and don't feel that it can nor should be made in the way that Alinsky does, but to take Alinsky's point to another example, 
the, uh, the ongoing health care debate. By shining a light on the evils of the insurance companies, the price gouging, the mounds and mounds of unnecessary administered bullshit, we can use those negatives to create a positive Medicare for all base. Rule 12. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. Never let the enemy score points because you're caught without a solution to the problem. We spend a lot of our energy on fighting, but what are we fighting for? What is it that we want instead of the status quo, and what are the ways that we can offer up to make it so? Have these answers. Revisit and we re rework them frequently. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves standing in the ashes with nothing but an empty victory. Rule 13. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Cut off the support network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after people and not institutions because people hurt faster. This can sound harsh and was probably one of the choice rules that got Alinsky delivered to the far right's list of servants of the devil. No, really, they called him that. But this list promotes the concept that not only are people always pulling the strings, but people can and will cave. The New York Stock Exchange is a building. It's the people that make it what it stands for. Again, I recommend reading Rules for Radicals, considering the place and time of its writing and how many parallels there are, while at the same time understanding that a lot has changed. In my mind, as we move forward, Alinsky's words on communication, collaboration, and community participation are vital, and can serve as inspiration for the new tactics, the new targets of today and tomorrow. Finally today, we speak with Wendell Potter, former Vice President of Corporate Communications for health insurance company Cigna. I should stress, former. Back in 2009, he testified in the Senate in order to expose health insurance industry practices. And now he's taking his expertise in both communications and insurance industry fuckery to found a news site called Tarbell. With a focus on big corporations and the power they wield, Tarbell seeks to provide both context and solutions for the oligarchical corporatocracy that we live under. Take a look. We want to help people understand how they can get more engaged, how they can not only become more informed, uh, but how they can become part of the solution. We'll be helping them to understand what organizations, uh, for example, are active on a certain issue that they might want to know about and maybe affiliate with and support in some way and what they can do as individuals. And talk about that spin issue, because, you know, we hear about things like big mergers and then people say, oh, this will be great for for the economy. It'll be great for the, the workplace. Talk a little bit about how the reality that you've seen on the inside when things like this happen. Yeah, it's, it is nothing more than spin. And I can vouch for that because I spent 20 years inside the health insurance industry. And on many occasions, I would be handling communications around some merger or acquisition and sometimes divestitures. And you can almost rest, rest assured that uh, almost without exception, any big merger or acquisition like we're seeing proposed in, in health insurance or, or CVS's uh, uh, proposed acquisition of Aetna, for example, consumers don't benefit. Uh, they, they talk a good game. They say this will help reduce expenses. But any savings that, that might, uh, that might uh, develop as a consequence of that merger rarely ever, if ever, is passed on to uh, consumers and patients. Uh, they go into the pockets of shareholders and executives. That's, uh, you can look at almost any kind of uh, acquisition that's taken place in the, in the recent past, certainly in healthcare, and you'll see that that's the case. They, they all the time, though, every time this is proposed, they will say, well, this will help reduce expenses or this will help uh, lower premiums. Uh, it just doesn't. It's just, it's just all hype. And, and, and moving along that, that line, I saw on, on Tarbell that it said that you'd be working with newsrooms nationwide, um, but corporate media is called that because, well, it's you know corporate media, uh, right. and they get money from a lot of the same companies that are spinning this to make it sound like we're the winners when we are, uh, in, uh, in fact, the losers. So what kind of partnerships can you can create with newsrooms uh, to avoid people like, you know, Sinclair Media to, to talk of mergers. Um, what kind of coalitions can you build with that? Well, I think, as a matter of fact, that for-profit uh, for media is, is part of the problem. And that's why we are structured as a, a nonprofit organization. 
uh, we will accept no advertising. And we want to have partnerships with other nonprofit news organizations around the country. And there are many of them now. Uh, we want to be free of any kind of conflicts of interest. And certainly uh, that includes from advertisers. One of the problems, uh, we don't see, for example, very much scrutiny of the pharmaceutical industry. Certainly uh, on, in, among TV stations or, or TV broadcasting organizations because they spend so much money buying ads. Uh, uh, you can imagine what their revenues would be like if the, uh, if the pharmaceutical companies were not able to, to advertise anymore. So they have a vested interest in they being the, the for-profit media and also protecting a very profitable status quo. We want to work with some of the, the uh, state-based or uh, local-based nonprofit news organizations. And there are several, like I said, around the country that uh, do good investigative reporting, we want to give some exposure to some of the work that they do, give them national exposure, because we will be a national pu national online publication. So why did you feel that it was important to, to start uh, Tarbell specifically as opposed to latching on to, you know, like an existing alternative media site or, a, or an existing investigative reporting uh, collaborative effort? Why did you feel it was important to start uh, a, your own specific project? Because of, of, of our mission, we want to, uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat different from a lot of uh, existing media organizations. We, uh, uh, our, 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 the nonprofit that I formed to publish our bill is called To Be Fair. Uh, it's, uh, it's a 501c3 organization. We named it that because we want to help create uh, a more just and fair society through journalism. Uh, so we have a mission. It's not just to inform people. We want to help uh, change things. Uh, we will. We also want to have uh, a, a heavy emphasis on solutions, as I mentioned, and, and there are a lot of not a lot of not a lot of existing news organizations that are interested in that or know how about going or, or, or have the expertise about doing that. And we also, like I said, we want to help people understand how they can be part of the solution, and that's something that very very few news organizations are are doing or uh, feel that is part of their mission. Uh, so we, we're, we're, we're unique. I know that's a, an overused word, but uh, considering all that we're trying to do, uh, we felt that it was important for us to start our, start our own publication. So talk about some of those solutions. I know that because of your own history, there will be solutions that are um, perhaps pointed at the pharmaceutical or the insurance industry. But will, will these solutions be, uh, you know, electoral solutions? Will these be, you know, protest solutions? Do you have sort of a, a structure built for that already? Or, or talk about a little bit about like the solution side of things. Yeah, it can, it, take, it can take many different forms. It can be, uh, here's, here's what this particular bill uh, is, what it says, and here is who is sponsoring it. Uh, it could be, for example, uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. Uh, here's a link to what that bill is. Here's a link to his website about what that bill is. And if you are interested in supporting that piece of legislation, uh, Senator Sanders has a way for you to, to, to sign on to be supportive. Uh, but also there can be uh, pieces of legislation that uh, uh, a lot of advocacy groups uh, are opposed to. And here are some of the names of advocacy groups that are engaged on this particular issue. Uh, here's, uh, uh, for example, here's how you can uh, communicate directly with uh, Big Pharma. Uh, here's here's a, a, a way to you can uh, reach out to if you have a, a, a reason that you'd like to communicate with the pharmaceutical industry. Here is how you can actually do that. Uh, so we want to help people understand the ways that they can actually, uh, as individuals and as parts of uh, maybe a member of a group, can have some impact. How, how, and we want to help people understand how they can reach their members of Congress or their state legislator. And the, and the, the solutions can vary uh, from here's what this particular bill does and why you might want to support it or here's why you should know more about it, to here's how the healthcare system in Canada operates. Here's how the system in the UK operates. We don't see nearly enough of that. Uh, it's very rare to see any reporting uh, in the US media about how other systems abroad uh, actually operate. And for many years in my old job in the industry, I spent a lot of my time trying to mislead people about those, those healthcare systems because 
again, we wanted to protect a very profitable status quo and any kind of changes that would get us uh, uh, close to a Canadian healthcare system, for example, would certainly threaten the industry's profits. Uh, and so consequently, we misled people to scare people away from the Canadian healthcare system in particular. So we want to try to, to a certain extent, I want to, I'm doing this to make amends. I feel like I, uh, truth, I know, in fact, I know I misled people about, uh, uh, about the healthcare systems abroad, and I want to do something about that. So having had that big bullhorn that you had working for big corporations, now you obviously have a smaller one just because of the, the nature of non, not-for-profit media. And this is perhaps an impossible question to answer, but how, how, are you, uh, how are you going up against those big bullhorns, knowing exactly the kind of money and the kind of power that's behind them? Yeah, well, there's no doubt. They will always have more money than, than we do. And and they will always have more money than advocacy groups. Uh, and uh, I, But I think uh, there is power in information, and we certainly want to make sure that we're doing our part to inform people and to, to give people a perspective and an information they, they, they probably will not have gotten anywhere else. Um, we also think that by helping people understand how they can be more involved, we can help build movements, uh, and and we definitely want to to do that. That's part of our our mission as well too. Uh, as well too, we really want to uh, have an impact, to make a difference, uh, to help change things when they need to be changed, to disrupt the status quo. And I know that uh, that can happen if we have more people who are informed and engaged. I don't expect that. And, and know that we will never uh, have 325 million Americans uh, on the same page and interested and, and engaged. But a, a, a significant percentage uh, of Americans, I think, would be interested in being more informed and and being more of a part of the pro part of the solution rather than part of the problem. For more information on Wendell and Tarbell, visit tarbell.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. I will be performing live spoken word and projected visuals this Friday, February 9th at Bone Shaker Books in Minneapolis. For more information on that and other performances, visit artkillingapathy.com. And you can find the other sites mentioned in this week's show in the upcoming slide and the show description. For interim updates, as well as posted videos, images, and articles, visit us on social media. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick. To keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to ACT OUT, visit Patreon.com slash ACT OUT. I'm not a violent man, but I